10 minutes. And then we have a concept of hot seat. You know, a couple of residents, they may ask questions, clarifications, or we may, you know, discuss amongst ourselves. Dr. Mathi, another consultant of uh, ours, he will be joining in short uh, period of time. So we That's wind perfect. up exactly in uh, one hour. <clears throat> That's perfect. That's perfect. Uh, so I think we can, we can start probably. No, I, I will. I will just, uh, you know, go ahead. Okay. Uh, okay. Be alive, sir. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online, Lecture 163, Retina Session 15. We have with us Professor Marco Lapidi, and he'll be talking on putting it all together, clinical applications of multimodal imaging. I request Dr. Lalit Verma, sir, to please introduce, sir. Thank you, Dr. Rolika, and thank you, Dr. Santosh. Uh, uh, it's my honor and privilege to be introducing Dr. Marco Lupidi. He is from Italy and uh, very thankful to him to, for have consented to be with us uh, for an hour or so. And uh, as you see, his uh, uh, credentials are listed here. Medical degree uh, with praise in 2009, then residency in ophthalmology with praise uh, under supervision of Professor Alfonso, then medical retina clinical research fellow 2014-15, then PhD in translational medicine, very unique uh, and surgery uh, in 2019. And currently, he is Associate Professor of Thalmology at the Department of Experimental and Clinical Medicine in, uh, in, uh, in Kona, Italy. And uh, he's heading the Medical Retina and Imaging Unit. So very privileged to have him here. He has been an investigator in several multicentric trials and invited speaker in many international meetings. And very pleasing to see authored 115 mm -hmm. publications International peer review journals and a several, several laurels to his name. Dr. Marco, very privileged to have you here. And uh, you see, uh, I hope, you see, we, we all know the current status of uh, this multimodal imaging. You see, gone are the days when you used to totally depend on ophthalmoscopy or fundus photography. Today, all clinicians, uh, you see, have access to various uh, imaging modalities. And they have, since they have multiple in numbers, we, we try to, you know, have uh, accumulated data from colored photograph, infrared, or, or you know, autofluorescence, then angiography, then ICG, and try to collate even octa so as to arrive at a one composite picture and so as to, you know, uh, arrive at one working diagnosis for the benefit of patient. So very happy to, you know, have you here with us. So all for you for another 40, 45 minutes. We'll love to see all your slides and images. Over to you, Dr. Marco. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for the kind invitation. It's a huge honor and a privilege to be with you all. And uh, first of all, let me congratulate for such a, a great initiative. And uh, I just appreciated how diffuse is uh, this network. Uh, this is a, a, with a, a, an important pedagogic role and uh, it's, uh, it's a really, really a great initiative. And uh, uh, let me thank my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Jay Shablani, because that introduced me to this, uh, uh, to this initiative. It's really a great friend. It's probably the biggest researcher uh, that I have ever met. So, uh, it's uh, it's uh, I am really I'm really thankful to him for for this uh, this opportunity. So um, and thank you very much to you all for this um, the introduction. So uh, aim of the current lecture is to have a global overview on the clinical applications of multimodal imaging. As you told, or as you hear before. Uh, the, we all start our clinical assessments from the uh, retinal clinical assessment from the ophthalmoscopy. And, uh, uh, but anyway, that as uh, the corresponding in terms of imaging uh, is the, the color fundus photo, but actually we have so many different imaging modalities that we are going to talk on and that we have to put the different findings related to each single imaging modality altogether. So these are my disclosures. The current gold standard 
in retinal and coronal imaging is based on two major groups of imaging modalities. We have a label-free imaging and we have a labeled or dye imaging. When we consider, uh, except from the color fundus photo, we have a label-free imaging, which is based on, mostly on infrared, the red-free imaging, the multicolor images, which is especially obtained by confocal devices, which has a sort of mix of infrared reflectance, blue reflectance, and green reflectance. Then there are different types of autofluorescence. So we're not speaking anymore about reflectance, but we are speaking about the re-emission of a tissue that is illuminated with a certain wavelength. And we can differentiate the blue autofluorescence from the near infrared autofluorescence. Then we have a dye imaging. And this dye imaging is mostly based on the well-renowned fluorescent angiography and the indocyanine or infracyanine green angiography. It depends, the difference in between these two is the presence of the iodium or not. And uh, then there is the OCT, so which is the gold standard for assessing the macular diseases in, in the major part of the disease, and that we can that we have commonly introduced from uh, from late 90s to the to our clinical practice. And then the most relevant and innovative approach that we currently have in our clinical setting, so we are not speaking about the, the scientific purposes or non-clinical settings, but what we have actually in our clinical settings and is coupled with the OCT is the OCT angiography, which is a label-free imaging modality that may allow us to have further information related to the perfusion status of a certain lesion. So, let, let us start from the multicolor. This is an example of infrared image. And uh, okay, simultaneously, we have the, the multicolor image of the same patient with a, with a healthy high. And the multicolor, you know that it's a fusion of three different wavelengths. It means the reflectance coming from three different wavelengths, which is uh, the blue reflectance and all the things that you see mostly in blue are related to the vitro retinal interface or the inner retinal layers. To, in terms of uh, an axial uh, reference might be the ganglion cell layer. Then we have the, re the green reflectance and it, uh, it's involved the central part of the retina so all the things that you generally see in green are coming from the internal part of the retina. And all the things that you generally see in red with the reddish aspect, this reddish aspect is related to things coming from the outer nuclear layer to the photoreceptors layer and the RPE or the RPE Brooks membrane complex. Obviously, to have a, an image more similar to the color fundus photo, different devices, and above all the Spectralis, Heidelberg Engineering Spectralis device, which has introduced this imaging modality, has uh, uh, given a pseudo color to the retinal vessels, which although located at the inner part of the retina are rendered in a red, with a reddish aspect but just for similarity with the fundus photo. And we can image, oh, this is an LT subject, and then there is a patient with a central retinal band occlusion. And since it is an imaging modality that we can consider a depth resolved imaging modality, we can distinguish different lesions at different levels of depth. It means that uh, we have the three different uh, um, reflectances uh, are highlighting different structures at different levels of depth. So then there is the structural OCT and the structural OCT of the same patient is generally used to let you know the current 
conditions are the situation of a retinal tissue. And uh, in this case, the same patient with a central retinal vein occlusion, uh, the, the presence of subretinal fluid, intraretinal fluid, the, the presence of these uh, lesion, hyperreflective lesion within the inner retinal layers. And when there is a change in terms of reflectivity of the inner retinal layers like this, it means generally that there is an ischemic component of the disease itself. And then there, are, there is subretinal fluid. So OCT is also able to allow us, and we all know, to evaluate the evolution, the longitudinal evolution of a certain disease or a certain disease with a macular involvement mostly, and how it changes with time and with treatment. So it means that at the baseline, we had the chance to evaluate the different findings, the presence of such a subtype of lesion, and that can make up hypothesizing that there might be a potential ischemic component of the lesion itself. And in fact, in the same area, but after, for example, three months, we can observe a substantial thinning of the inner retinal layer and the, this thinning of the inner retinal layers is the natural consequence of an ischemic damage that has been shown at the baseline examination. And this is how appears a patient with, who has a good functional outcome, but with the, the, the clear evidence of a disorganization of the inner retinal layers, which is mostly due to the absence of focal absence of retinal tissue, and this is related to the uh, to the ischemic damage that has happened at the baseline with uh, this retinal vein occlusion. This is the same patient that we are assessing with a different imaging modality, and this different imaging modality is, for example, the fluorescent angiography which is the gold standard examination to assess the extension of the damage and the perfusion status of a certain disease. Uh, and starting from the early phases, you have the diffuse out of hyperfluorescence coming from the choroid and the retinal arteries, which are starting to fill and then there is a substantial, substantial delay of the filling of the, the, venous, uh, the venous component of the vascular tree, retinal vascular uh, tree. And uh, the late, going to the late stages uh, or the late frames of the fluorescent angiography, we can observe the, the perspective, perspective increase in terms of filling of the retinal vessels and all the hypofluorescent areas might be related during the late phase to a sort of um, uh, sort of uh, um, shadowing of the retinal hemorrhages that can cover the background fluorescence of the retina itself. So we are assessing the same patient with different imaging modalities that are going to provide different findings. And it has been recently, with the last years, introduced also the wide field and the ultra wide field in geography. We, we started from the 30 degrees with the time, then we moved to the 55 degrees or 50 degrees. And now there are several devices which are able to image the far periphery with a single shot. In this case, it is a 102 degree and that can be tilted in order to obtain information related to the temporal or the nasal periphery of the retina, and there is also the Optus device, so we will see in different diseases later on, that is able to image till 200 degrees of the retina. Then there is the OCT angiography. So the OCT angiography is a, a completely label-free imaging modality that is going to provide information related to the perfusion status of a lesion. It means that in this case with OCT angiography, we're not 
able to say there is an ischemic damage or there is no ischemic damage, but there is an impairment in terms of perfusion of a certain area. This impairment is something that uh, is shown by a loss of the normal architecture of the superficial or deep capillary plexus. And here, the, the, green, the yellow arrows are going to highlight the presence of confluent areas of uh, abnormal perfusion, because you cannot see the normal network, the normal network of capillaries in between the vessels as you can observe here. But it's on OCT and geography, we cannot say there is no flow within the vessel but we can just say that there is an impairment of perfusion because we can check the different imaging modalities. And by checking the different imaging modalities, we can couple the two information, starting from fluorescent angiography and going to OCT angiography. Anyway, this is still important, even if we are not able to say that there is perfusion or not, there is an ischemic damage or not, and why it is very important, the information coming from OCT and geography. Because when you see that there is a, an abnormality in terms of perfusion, it might be related to a, long, uh, to an, um, a potential progressive damage of a tissue, even if the vessel is not, not abnormally perfused. And this information are not coming from fluorescent angiography, but are coming from those from OCT angiography, which is a depth resolved imaging modality. So we can observe different degree of impairment of the retinal perfusion at different levels of depth. As uh, in some cases, we can observe the abnormalities of perfusion at the level of the superficial capillary plexus, at the level of the deep capillary plexus, and as we will see later on, and how these, these abnormalities in terms of perfusion may change from the baseline to the follow-up assessment. And there are some cases, for example, related to the resolution of the intraretinal fluid or a potential improvement of the retinal perfusion due, for example, to the onset of collateral vessels, that this condition of perfusion impairment may change with time. I will show you again, as this patient from baseline to the follow-up, there is a potential uh, increase in terms of visibility of the vascular network in between large retinal vessels. And there are also this, the visibility of collateral vessels that are developing in between the, the superotemporal and inferotemporal arcade, which are substantial reduction of the capillary dropout, that, which, is not, which is not, as a, I told you again, a, a certain dropout in terms of non-perfusion, but there is a, the, at the baseline, the visibility of a perfusion impairment, the blood flow may be reduced in that moment and may increase again later on with or without the treatment. So what is important with a multimodal imaging assessment? So let's start to the core of the, of the lecture. The multimodal imaging assessment may have a role in replace dye and geography with a label-free approach. So we will see how is it possible to obtain information that we generally take from dye and geographies with a label-free approach. Then we will move to a different thing, to detect something that is not detectable on conventional dye and geographies. Then we will move to a step forward, OCT, an OCT angiography is a depth resolved imaging modality. So it means that it's a 3D assessment. So this is a sort of 3D functional because you see the perfusion of a tissue vascular assessment when integrating the OCT angiography in the multimodal imaging. And then we will say something new about it. 
So how can we replace dye and geography with a label-free approach? Let's start from this case. This is a patient that has recently uh, came to our clinic uh, suffering from a sudden vision loss after an intravitreal treatment for uh, um, pachychoroid neovascular active pachychoroid neovasculopathy. And uh, she was complaining about this and this about a uh, sudden re reduction of the best correction, corrected visual acuity. And these are the information that we can obtain from a structural OCT. How can we interpret this OCT? We have subretinal fluid. We have a fibrovascular PED. There is a lack of RPE in this area. So the RPE absence, and we can see the, the border of a potential rip or a potential tear of the RPE. And we can see where is the RPE after three years, which has rolled into this lesion. The RPE is the most hyperreflective structure in the retina. So it means that it's able to reflect the light coming from our device. And you can clearly see that the accumulation of the RPE that has been rolled uh, in this area is completely reflecting the light. And we don't have, in fact, any information related to the tissue underneath the rolled RPE. And then there are some remnants of the interdigitation zone. What is the cause of this condition? We perform in the same patient, the OCT and geography, and with the OCT and geography, we can clearly highlight the presence of a new vascular network, which is exactly located, and it was, this we can see in the, in the OCT angiogram, visualizing, visualizing a B-scan mode within the fibrovascular PED. So, we have with a single structural non-invasive OCT, not only the findings related to the RPE tier and the actual condition that has caused the reduction of, uh, uh, of visual acuity of the patient, but also we have a functional examination that highlights you the shape of the new vascularization and the exact location, location which is within the fibrovascular PED. And which kind of imaging modality would you choose to confirm these OCT and OCTA findings? Then if we need some finding to confirm, we can have in our assessment, for example, the fundus, the fluorescent angiography, the ICGA, the multicolor on the blood of fluorescence. If I have to avoid one of this, since we speak about the type one neovascularization and occult neovascularization, we will start from the ICGA rather than the fluorescent angiography, then we will consider the multicolor and the blue auto fluorescent. And if we include in our in multimodal imaging assessment these three findings, we will obtain some information related to, uh, in order to confirm what we have obtained with the structural OCT and OCTA. So first of all, this reddish lesion that we can clearly see on uh, on our multicolor imaging, we have already said that everything which is which has a reddish aspect on uh, uh, multicolor imaging comes from lesions related to the photoreceptors, the and the Brooks membrane RPE complex. So there is a damage at the level of these uh, structures. Then there is the blue autofluorescence, and the blue autofluorescence clearly see the the hypofluorescent area due to the lack of RPE in the subfoveal area, and there is an hyperautofluorescent area, which is due to the accumulation of the fluorophores within this, uh, uh, within this lesion. So it means that uh, the hyperaccumulation of the fluorophores are those fluorophores, the hyperautofluorescent fluorophores, which are related to the RPE. So, and how can we integrate these two findings in order to understand the cause of this condition? Then we will use ICGA. And the ICGA clearly shows the neovascular network, which is surrounded by this high hypofluorescent area. 
due to a sort of shadowing of the, the RPE accumulation. And this is, there is a, this high, almost uh, hyperfluorescent area. This is not an hyperfluorescence. This is, means that there is a, you, we can define uh, an increased visibility of the choroidal vessel. And if you look, in fact, at this vessel, you can see that there is a sort of attenuation of this large choroidal vessel. And then there is a good visibility of this large choroidal vessel within this area. So this is a window defect of the RPE that allows us to clearly visualize the, the, choroidal, the large choroidal vessel. And if we, we want to put together the information coming from the multicolor with the information coming from the ICGA, we can obtain those related to the localization of the RP after tier. And this includes the multicolor, which perfectly fits with the previous examination. And you can clearly see here. So the RP accumulation is within the hypofluorescent area that we had on ICGA, and which is the cause we can integrate with OCTA that clearly shows the new vascularization within. So you see that this different label-free, so non-invasive imaging modality are going to provide the same information given from the gold standard fluorescent, or in this case, ICG and geography. It's very important or the label free imaging modality also to assess, for example, the presence of lesions that are very frequent like type three neovascularization. Here we can have the focal dilation of uh, the retinal vessel. And then there is a, a late leakage with lipids. So these are the three different findings which are the gold standard to define a type three or RAP neovascularization. And then we can move toward the label-free imaging modality based on OCTA, which shows you this focal dilation of the vessel with the unpass projection of the ISO of the OCTA. And simultaneously, since it is an axially resolved examination, we can clearly see the two retinal vessels that are going to to deepen within the retina and making an anastomosis with something coming from the choroid. So we can have the same information provided from ICGA with a depth resolved approach and these vessels that are going to deep, to going deep into the retina and making an anastomosis with some other vessels coming from the choroid. The, there are several conditions in which we can obtain additional information when coupling different imaging modalities. This is a completely different disease like the liver miliary aneurysm, which is in the large family of the Coates disease. And it's a patient that came to me just a couple of months ago uh, with a sudden reduction of the visual acuity. And this was done to macular edema, but this lesion was there from several months, if not years. And the fluorescent angiography and the ICGA, you can see that we can couple this imaging modality. So the color fundus photo, in fact, this is also a confocal device, the Optus, which provides different information at different levels of depth, but it has a good rendering also in terms of, uh, of color fundus photo, uh, very similar to those we can obtain with uh, um, a fundus photography, a conventional fundus photography. And then there is the um, fluorescein and ICG and geography, which clearly shows you the impairment in terms of perfusion of the far, the, the peripheral retina, which the focal vascular dilation and those that are causing the exudation because those that are leaking on fluores on ICGA are those that potentially may have the highest leaking activity. And uh, there is this uh, attenuation, uh, the, uh, so the, this shadowing of the choroidal vessels due to the, the blood accumulation that we can see here. This is why, just because it's a, an old bleeding. And uh, OCT and geography clearly shows us that also within the 
within the area that uh, fluorescein angiography is not going to, to show uh, a feeling of the vessels in the, in the early arteriovenous phases, there is also flow by using the OCT angiography. Obviously, you can clearly see the presence of uh, the fluorescein within vessels in the late phases, but if you couple in the very early, and this the feeling of the vessels is very, very slow, you can obtain an information related to the perfusion status in the early phase itself by coupling OCT angiography and the fluorescein angiography. You can clearly see how there are vessels which are nicely, perf not nicely, but perfused, at least uh, uh, in every phase of, of the, the, of the angiogram. And then we can obtain additional information related to the, uh, the telangiectasis lesion, telangiectasis lesion uh, with, by coupling the, the late phase with the, the diffuse leakage, which is definitely lower on ICGA that clearly highlights the structure of the different, uh, um, the different uh, telangiectatic vessels. And uh, the, the, we can couple this information with the structural OCT by viewing the fluorescein, the, the, the macular edema, the macular involvement, which causes a, a reduction of visual acuity. But we can also put a structural OCT directly on the lesion itself. And we can observe that there is a substantial impairment of the retinal architecture and uh, this hyperreflectivity uh, underneath the retina is related to the, the bleeding that we had in the early phases of the disease. The key point too is to how we can obtain information coming from the multimodal imaging in detecting nascent new vascular lesions. So detecting something which might be very difficult to detect on conventional imaging. And this is a patient of mine that uh, came to the clinic by uh, suffering from some um, blurring of the visual acuity related to some relative scotomas in their visual field, just one eye. And uh, on multicolor imaging, we don't have significant uh, changes about the inner retina. It's mostly focused in this case on uh, on the mid retina, you see this, uh, this greenish aspect. The blue autofluorescent is going to show some uh, light, very light hyper autofluorescent in uh, the posterior pole, but the ICGA clearly shows the impairment in these stromal phases of uh, the periocapillaries perfusion. And this lesion has been defined uh, associated with this thickening of the photoreceptors in subfovial area as uh, a multiple evanescent wide dot syndrome. Uh, the patient was just observed since these lesions are going to, uh, to regress spontaneously in the in large part of the cases. And after, but after six weeks, and with uh, a completely negative autofluorescent, we started to observe this abnormality, subfamily uh, abnormality that we have with this very small, very limited pigment epithelium detachment. And uh, we continue to observe this patient that after eight weeks, this uh, lesion was substantially increased and the visual acuity was uh, substantially reduced. So uh, at this point, this patient underwent uh, uh, fluorescein angiography, which highlights the presence of a central stain lesion without a substantial leakage. In fact, we don't have any evidence of the potential leakage, leak, leakage from macular area. And uh, we performed the OCT angiography in the same patient. We don't have any abnormality about the superficial intermediate and deep capillary plexus. But when we move and also outer retinal layers, there is this, this hypo intense lesion in, in, at the level of the choreocapillaries, 
but no evidence of a neovascular network. So what we did in this case is to perform a special type of OCT angiograph, which is a high density OCTA. The high density OCTA is an OCTA coming from a special pattern that uh, some devices as the spectralis may allow to uh, reduce the distance in between two consecutive biscans. And with this uh, aspect, we were able to obtain this focal flow signal within the lesion. You see how small is the focal signal? Because, and we, we can conclude that the optimized visualization of choroidal flow, blood flow relies on the volume scan density. And uh, we, at that time, we, we were sure that within this lesion, there was a, 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 an early neovascularization. And we tried to, we, we proposed to the patient uh, an intravitreal injection, but she denied, she was not, uh, she decided not to undergo the treatment. She came back after one month and this was the situation. So we can conclude that the, the optimized visualization of the choroidal neovascularization or of the blood flow within a choroidal neovascularization relies on volume scan density. Then there is, uh, you, we have already introduced the concept of the 3D vascular assessment, OCT, it's, and also OCT and geography is a depth resolved imaging modality in, uh, and this while OCT, uh, while fluorescent and geography and ICGA are only two dimensional examination. And to have axial uh, differentiation in between the two, we have to couple the two examination, fluorescein with the ICGA. But anyway, this, it will be always different from, from a fluorescein and from a OCT and OCT angiography. This is a 30 degrees fluorescein angiography. This is uh, with a, a, a patient with a diabetic retinopathy with new vessels at disc. And the, the true shape of the neovascularization was shown with this OCT angiography by segmenting the vitro-retinal interface and the nerve fiber layer within our volume scan. And we can clearly see that the size of the lesion related to the leakage is definitely larger to the one of the true neovascularization that we can observe on OCT angiography. And uh, there are also some lesions like this uh, that uh, are shown on OCTA with an aberrant neovascularization, which are almost hidden on fluorescent angiography. So, the, and we defined several years ago how the clear identification of poorly leaky neovascularization strictly relies on the mm, on a, com, a simultaneous assessment with fluorescein angiography and OCTA. OCTA is also useful to detect neovascularization or abnormal vessels, which are developing not on the surface of the retina, but within the retina, as the interretinal microvascular rearrangements of abnormalities. And since, as we said, it is a depth resolved imaging modalities, we are able to differentiate the superficial capillary plexus from the deep capillary plexus in order to have a, the entire visualization. If we couple the two of these uh, microvascular changes, which are developing within the retina, and also they are topographical relationship with areas of impaired perfusion. As we all know, they develop at the borders of abnormally perfused areas. Here is a patient with a diabetic retinopathy with a macular hemorrhage. Some hemorrhages are rendered on OCT, on multiple color imaging as, uh, the, um, as with a, the pseudo color and uh, the device is able to detect structures that has a, have a shape similar to the similar to an MRH and rendered with the same color. But uh, ev not everything which is rendered in red on multicolor images means hemorrhage. We performed in the same patient the fluorescein angiography, which clearly highlights the presence of neovascularization, probably abnormal vessels uh, uh, at the level of or neovascularization arising, arising from the peripheral vascular arcade, and also some irma 
in the mid temporal periphery with an extensive area of uh, uh, non-perfusion. So we, perform, we coupled this examination with the non-invasive structural OCT. And what we obtain in this area is the presence of the hemorrhage. So the confirmation of the axial location of the hemorrhage, which is underneath the internal limiting membrane. But there is also another structure, which is arising from the borders of the peripoveal vascular arcade, which is, uh, as we have seen, coupling the information of the hyperfluorescence of the fluorescent angiography and the localization within the vitreous cavity of this lesion. So we can conclude that this lesion is a vitreo retinal neovascularization arising from the peripheral vascular arcade. And the confirmation that this, that structure is perfused is given from OCT and geography that allows us to detect the clear flow signal coming from this structure itself, which is growing into the vitreous cavity. And we can clearly see how the retina is globally uh, hypoperfused. So the, the flow within or the normal capillary meshwork is not visible almost in the entire macular area with just uh, large vessels and focal vascular dilations. And after the pump photocoagulation, the patient has still some weak leakage from this neovascularization. It's almost uh, regressed, but the ear is still visible. And also the lesion in macular area is still there. But when we have to visualize the same lesion on uh, OCT and geography, we can clearly, clearly see how this lesion has shrinking compared to the lesion that we've seen before, the, while the, the perfusion status of the macula is almost unchanged. So this is the baseline examination on your left, uh, the follow-up after PRP, uh, after the PRP on your right, and you can clearly see how the, le 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 the new vascular le lesion has, uh, has been shrinking by the treatment. The patient only received PRP, no macular edema, no uh, anti-VGF has been administered, while the perfusion status of the retina has uh, uh, sub remained substantially unchanged, if not worse. The 3D vascular assessment, uh, now we are starting to introduce uh, the, a 3D approach and we can clearly see here how we can visualize in a 3D mode the new vascularization arising from this patient with, um, with uh, the retinal uh, branch retinal vein occlusion and uh, this uh, new vascular network arising from the superior temporal arcade also says to on, uh, on in a 3D mode coming from a label free examination. And this is another example of new vessels at the disc and in white, we can observe the, the new vessels and the normal um, vessels arising from the optic disc in yellow. So the key point four, what's next? We are going to, to go straight to the, the end of the lecture. Now we recently introduced uh, uh, some novel imaging modalities, which are going to be um, a sort of um, more detailed, more precise, more reliable OCT entry. This is the image that we can obtain on fluorescent angiography. These, uh, you, you can clearly see that in this healthy subject, the peripheral vascular arcade is uh, nicely, nicely visible, uh, but we can only have an idea of uh, the superficial and deep capillary plexus, which are superimposed. So with, since it is a 2D examination, a B-dimensional examination. This is a standard OCTA. So this is a standard OCTA of the superficial capillary plexus. And then we can clearly see here the entire uh, peripheral vascular arcade and a good visualization of the perfusion status of the retina. We can distinguish arteries from veins, but with the, our boosted OCTA, this is the image that we are going to obtain now. So now we currently work on such a good image. And this is an image which is based on an average 
uh, in C scan projection of the different high resolution OCT scan. So this is an image that has been obtained uh, in this way and provides us, since the different C scans are obtained in different moments consecutively and in with different hemodynamic levels, it means that we have the information about the true perfusion status of the patient without um, uh, without any potential criticism related to the, the moment in which you obtain the OCTA. So it takes both in consideration time and the hemodynamic of the patient. This is mostly important since we are now able to perform the same examination also at uh, the level of the cardiac capillaries. This is the histologic uh, specimen, specimen in a post-mortem, obviously, specimen of a healthy subject. And here is the visualization of uh, the cardiac capillaries. And this is the image that we can obtain with our boosted OCT angiograms. You can see how similar these two images are in between one to the other. So we have a good visualization of the entire network in vivo with a label-free approach. And it is mostly important since now we are able to couple this information, especially in the same device with a non-adaptive optics approach of the photoreceptors layer. So we can obtain also the information related to the cones integrity in the same patient in macular area with a non-adaptive optics approach with a sufficiently, uh, sufficiently large uh, scanning field, which is about 2.5 millimeters. So almost the same that we can obtain with the standard structural OCT. So in order to conclude, we have introduced by well-renowned imaging modalities, the OCT and geography, which is the most, the newer and, and the most powerful imaging modality that we should integrate in, the, um, in our current clinical practice. And why it is really important to integrate this in our imaging modality? Because it's label-free, and it is depth resolved. So it's perfectly coupled with the structural OCT. One is able to provide the status of the lesion, the integrity of the retinal tissue and choroidal tissue and RPE, and also about the vitreous, obviously. And simultaneously, we are able to provide information of the perfusion status of this lesion. The multiple label-free imaging modalities may sometimes provide the same findings of dye and geography. So let's start from label-free imaging modality. If necessary, we will integrate with dye and geography. Nascent or low flow vascular structures can be easily detected on OCT angiogram. So once more, there is a reason to introduce this novel imaging modality in our clinical practice. And because it can show both blood flow variations and in all structures that are suffering from dye leakage and every structure is suffering from dye leakage. And finally, an integrated multimodal approach is the current standard of care in different retinal and choroidal disorder. Thank you very much for the kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Marco. I think my friend, uh, Dr. Anuradha Mathieu has joined. Thank he you will, very much. He will lead the discussion here. Uh, I may have to leave in between, but it was a wonderful, wonderful, uh, you know, very clearly explanation of uh, starting with uh, what you call label-free vis-a-vis invasive kind of procedures. And uh, do you recommend, like you said in the last slide itself, that one should always start from uh, this non-invasive and then if required, move on to invasive. And the reason yes, I'm actually, asking is because a because lot of people, you see a lot of people uh, may not have access to all this uh, octa as of now. See, few centers or maybe ret pure retina centers will definitely have, but people who are not dealing with pure retina services, they may not have access to octa uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in their clinics. 
I do. Thank you very much for this. Is a great point. Uh, you know that actually with the the um, oh, with the diffusion of OCT and OCTA, um, the also this all these devices are going to be cheaper and cheaper, so more affordable expenses. But we have to to think that we have to start by the aim of providing the best retinal uh, care. And uh, um, if we can obtain the same information with a label-free approach, we can spur in terms of diangiographies, in terms of invasivity, in terms of money related to how this uh, uh, the, the, the dice are, are paid and reimbursed and uh, also the time to, to the access. So you can imagine how many patients we can examine in the same day with a label-free approach compared to a label approach. 40 minutes for, a, for an ICGA while uh, 30 seconds for an OCTA. So obviously not all the cases are mm, detected by... Uh, by label-free images. And I today I performed 15 ICGA. But anyway, every patient has previously undergone on label-free imaging modalities and just to provide uh, some additional information or the confirmation of, confirmation of a certain diagnosis. No, I agree, Dr. Which Barco. I As we gain experience on uh, these label-free, we become less dependent on, on uh, invasive modalities. You think a time will come then uh, when label free will ultimately replace uh, or uh, or uh, you know uh, will become less dependent on those patients? Yes, we are already less dependent by them, and uh, but I don't know if we will ever replace because there are several conditions like central serous choroid retinopathy or polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy which are strictly dependent on, uh, for example, on ICGA. So our treatment strategy is ICGA guided in that cases. So we cannot replace globally one drug, one yeah. uh, uh, imaging modality, but just select those cases in which they are not mandatory. Dr. Mehti, I think we'll lead the discussion now. Yeah, uh, thank I you. I think I may have to leave in between. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you very much. Enjoy, well, enjoy your talk uh, and maybe we'll have you Physically in one of our uh, major national... I do hope so. Events. I do hope so. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Dr. Mehti. Thank you, Professor Marco, for his uh, excellent presentation on uh, multimodal imaging. I, I just wanted to ask uh, whether you uh, this uh, session is mainly for the PGs uh, or uh, postgraduate students. And so uh, in which cases do you... Uh, really uh, advise and multi-modal uh, imaging, especially in, in our setup, we uh, we are actually advising multimodal in the in specifically the polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy, uh, one of the indications. So uh, can you just highlight in which cases we have to do a multimodal imaging? So there are, I obviously to have an idea on how the complete multimodal works, uh, you have to have a good experience of integrating the different modalities. Because uh, if you have, first of all, you have different findings from every different modality and you have to, um, to be able to compare the different findings or, and also to link one finding coming from for example, for multicolor to this, the corresponding finding coming from the OCT. Anyway, what I do, uh, uh, there are some conditions in which a complete multimodal imaging assessment is absolutely mandatory as uh, you introduce for sure the polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy in which you have different elements to, to highlight. You have to detect the branching vascular network and the time of the perfusion of the branching vascular network in order to differentiate it from a true neovascularization. Then you have to localize the polyps and then the, the exact location of them in order to guide your, uh, your PDT treatment. So I, I, for example, in polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy, I obviously treat the patient with an Everest 2 protocol. So for me, it's absolutely mandatory to provide both anti-VGF and the PDT in the same patient, at least at baseline, then I will use the PDT for the rescue therapy. 
uh, as a rescue therapy in uh, uh, in a patient that is going to develop no mm, new polypoidal lesions. But anyway, in this case, it's absolutely mandatory to, to perform the ICGA. So we cannot completely replace the label free imaging. At the reverse, there are conditions, for example, every subtype of macular neovascular relation related to the AMD. And in this case, all the neovascularization uh, are, can be detected with OCT and geography. So you have the clear visualization of type one, type two, type three neovascularization. And you have the structural information coming from the OCT. You have the evidence of the perfusion of the lesion. So there is flow within that lesion and you can start the treatment. Right. Uh, uh, re regarding this application of Octa in PCV, do you, uh, do you recommend that uh, ICP angiography is mandatory in the PCV? Because Octa is giving a lot of information, even though... Uh, the newer generation of OCTs are also giving a lot of information in the PCV as well. So I do recommend the use because the, mm, the, we have a great visualization, not of the poly, but, but of the branching vascular network. So we have a very good visualization of the branching vascular network, which is, this, which is the area that we have to, uh, to, to laser. Uh, at the reverse, obviously, the visualization of the flow within the polyps is a completely different concept. Uh, when I was in Paris uh, and during my fellowship, I started treatment with a special device, only the polypoidal lesion, because I was able to perform very small spots of PDT. So I tried, to, I started to laser only the lesion. But actually, the currently available PDT devices are not only able to treat lesion not smaller than 1,600 micrometers. So it means that you have to treat all the branching vascular network. And so it's, it's very important. The polyp are not nicely visible on OCTA because the flow within the polyp is underneath a certain threshold. And this threshold is uh, related to the capability of the OCT to detect the lesion itself, uh, to detect the flow itself. And so to have an idea of where the polyps are localized, uh, it's uh, important to co-use the structural OCT images and uh, the OCTA images to see, for example, the other three structural signs of, of polyps, which is uh, a dome, um, sharp peak PD, the complex RP elevation, or uh, which, which are the, the, the markers of the, which are the markers of the polypoidal lesion itself. Right. Uh, actually, in India, uh, presently, we don't have the PDT. So the role of ICG is now coming down and we are uh, dependent more on OCT and OCTA. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, Dr. Rolika, do we have any question for uh, Professor Marco? Yes, sir. Uh, so the question is that how would we approach a case of CNVM in pregnancy in terms of multimodal imaging? I do think this is a very, very important point because uh, if everything that we can spare in a patient uh, is in a, uh, in a in patient during pregnancy is uh, mandatory for us. So uh, I will start with uh, the color fundus photos, obviously, or the multicolor imaging in some cases. We detect uh, the abnormalities at the level of the RP, the structural CT highlights the presence of potential PDT and the exudation related to the lesion or the subtype of the lesion and OCTA to detect the, imper the, the perfusion status of the lesion. Then there is another point, how we treat this patient. And uh, because uh, to per to pro especially uh, there are always major issue related to the use of anti-VGF in, uh, in this patient. Nevertheless, I don't think that we can avoid the anti-VGF treatment in a patient uh, although in pregnancy with the site threatening disease. If, if we have to treat this patient, uh, which is the right time to treat, right? Obviously we cannot wait much, but still uh, as far as the trimester goes, which would be the right term to treat the CNVM in pregnancy? Uh, it's really, really, it's really difficult. Probably some idea we can have about the, the pregnancy time. 
uh, if it is in the first trimester, second trimester, third one, uh, I re but I really don't know. We have uh, very limited, luckily, experience about this patient. We generally treated this patient with anti-VGF, especially myopic patient with the type 2 neovascularization, we cannot wait, which cannot wait uh, for a long time because this is uh, in a young patient, a side threatening condition. And mostly we can observe that uh, this, uh, the effect of the anti-VGF is almost uh, exerted exclusively within the eye. Nevertheless, it's always a, a, a good dilemma to, to decide whether to treat or not. Great. Thank Thanks. you very much. Um, I think uh, there's another question if you would like to answer. That would be the last yeah, question sure. because our time is already For sure, up. for sure. But what is the role of, uh, possible role of artificial intelligence in terms of multimodal imaging? And are there any ongoing studies and researches for the same? So uh, it's difficult to put all together. <laughs> because uh, in this case, because uh, there are so many different findings and so many different modalities. So I do think that we are not at the point to have big data assessment uh, coming from so many different uh, devices. So in, because, but we are at the time to put all together big data coming from each single imaging modality. Then the next step will be collect all the data from each single assessment in terms of AI of an imaging modality finding and to provide potential interconnection in between, in between them. But actually, I don't think we are at the point to integrate imaging modality in an AI assessment, different imaging modalities in an AI assessment. I will just add one point, like uh, in the recent studies of Hawk and Harrier, they have used the AI to for a quantification analysis. Qualitatively, we, we do see the interretinal fluid, the subretinal fluid, but it is very difficult to measure that AI has been used in the study to quantify the amount of interretinal fluid, which is responding to this uh, newer molecule. So I think that is one thing the AI has uh, has given the great, great contribution. Yeah. yeah, 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 definitely. I completely agree with you. Uh, Ralika, do we have any more questions? Otherwise, we no, will. Sir. And uh, yeah, we'll hit nine o'clock too. Thank Thanks. you, Professor Marco, for your excellent Thank you very much. And discussion. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you very you. much. And, it has uh, been a great we... honor and a privilege to be with you. Thank you, sir, for and taking our Hopefully, we will time. see you soon in person. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for Thank attending the much. lecture. And we have our next session on December 24th. That will be the pathophysiology of retinal injury by Dr. Mohit Dobra. Looking forward to seeing you all there. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you very much. Good night.